I want to start out by um, welcoming those of you from the community who came tonight, along with our UCI colleagues, of course. Um, we're very glad to be launching this community lecture series where our goal is really to do outreach and talk to people in the community about the Stem Cell Center, about CIRM, about what's going on here in the context of where basic science and clinical translation science are really meeting. And so that's our job tonight. I'm going to start off with just a few minutes of introduction about the center, um, about the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic, about CIRM, about stem cells, this sort of thing. And then Dr. Boda is going to take it over. It'll be my pleasure to introduce her in a, in a few shakes of the leg here. She's going to talk to you about um, both a mix of the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic and glioblastoma, her basic science research, and also translational clinical study research. Then we're going to turn over one more time and come back to me, again, mainly from the community conversation perspective, because one of the things that we really want to try to convey through these um, lectures is the idea of a continuum, that basic science is related to translational science, is related to going all the way through into the clinic and treating people. And you have to have that pipeline. And so the story that I'm going to tell you a little bit at the end is about how our studies with neural stem cell transplantation really grew into that in the context of glioblastoma. And so this is an area where lots of connections and ser serendipity are nicely illustrated, I think. So about the center, um, first of all, actually right here, you can see on the first slide, it says that you're in the Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center, and this is a CIRM Institute. And so I want to start out with really just a couple of definitions about what that means. What is a CIRM Institute? So s how many folks in the audience know what CIRM or California Institute of Regenerative Medicine is? Well, all right, that's awesome. So this was funded <laughs> by a Prop 71, which was a huge investment on the part of Californians, $3 billion to invest in developing uh, an understanding of stem cells at all different kinds of levels, starting out with embryonic cells on up through induced pluripotent and uh, uh, multipotent neural stem cells and neural progenitor cells and other cell populations with their potential to move on into clinical therapeutics. So an enormous investment the state made. This building that you're sitting in is one of those investments. So one of the things that they did early on was to invest in bricks and mortar. And so like other stem cell centers around the state, this is one of the results of that, of course, with some help from Sue and Bill Gross. The second thing um, I just want to set up by way of general explanation is the concept of a stem cell and what do we mean by that. So stem cells are undifferentiated cells that divide and their daughter cells go on to do one of two things. They differentiate and become a part of your body or they remain as a stem cell so that there's always a pool of stem cells to draw on. In fact, we now know that every adult tissue that we have in your body has a resident pool of stem cells that are capable of responding to injury, to disease, to insults, to just a need to be able to draw onto them for various reasons. And if we look at this diagram as an example of stem cells, the idea is that at the trunk, at the very base, at the roots, are the most undifferentiated stem cells that can literally become anything in your body. But as you move up this trunk and out towards the branches, the cells become more and more differentiated or more and more specialized. And so, for example, the cells that Daniela and I are going to talk about today have to do with the central nervous system. And by the time you get way up into those branches, even a stem cell, a multipotent stem cell, can only make three different kinds of cells, a neuron, an astrocyte, and an oligodendrocyte. And so the idea of specialization is very important here. So while it's true that a stem cell can be anything when it grows up, that is up to a point. Because it's going to listen to things in its environment, it's going to be educated over time in the process of differentiation. So I mentioned you're sitting in the UCI Sue and Bill Gross Stem Cell Research Center, and I just want to give a couple of slides of background there. We were organized in 2006. The first director of the center um, was Peter Donovan, followed by Sid Golub, who's in the audience tonight. I have the privilege of following on from the two of them. There's 23, actually as of this week, 24 faculty um, that are resident in this center who do research on all different aspects of stem cells. I'll come to that in a minute. We have over 48 faculty across the campus that are involved in stem cell research in our programs. And a majority of those are in the School of Medicine and College of Health Sciences, but about a quarter are actually in School of Biological Sciences. And we have representation from a lot of different departments, including the schools of engineering, law, and School of the Arts. And so we're really quite a diverse center in terms of our structure and function. 
Of course, a majority focus in this building has to do with basic science research, and that's quite diverse. So at the level of cells and systems, on up through biomedical engineering. In fact, we have a new initiative that's launching to add faculty in the area of organ and tissue engineering and complex 3D systems, and in the area of ethics and policy. And so Sid Golub, Dr. Golub, well, he was director here, was a tremendous leader in this area. Um, he was director of FASAB for a number of years and has a lot of experience in this domain. Um, and recently, we just got a grant from the provost office to hold a special series of conferences in January that are about communicating science and confronting extremism um, as its views towards science, like anti-vaccines and uh, anti-stem cell and stem cell clinics that might be operating uh, a little bit outside the norm of clinical domain. And we're excited to have those aspects of our ethics and policy program coming up. We also have a very strong translational component to the center. And um, investigators that are here and distributed across campus work in a long uh, list that you can see here, neurological disease and injury, cognitive and neuromuscular, vision diseases, diabetes, cancers, uh, cardiovascular disease. And so much of the work that starts on this continuum of very basic science, our goal and the goal of the investigators here is really to feed on up through clinical translation and into clinical trial. And so. When I say translational medicine, I think I gave a public lecture uh, a couple of uh, uh, months ago, and one of the audience members stopped me and said, what do you mean by that? And I realized I better back up and put a slide in that has to do what we mean, and we often refer pretty, pretty uh, simplistically that we're moving from bench to bedside or on into the next domain for clinical medicine into practice. So that means trying to take things that we discover in our basic science and move them on through clinical application. But you can see here that in between this big hill where we discover a lot and less stuff gets over to the bed, the bedside portion of the equation, there's sharks and rainy clouds and all kinds of hazards. And oftentimes um, in this cartoon, it's illustrated, we call that the valley of death. And the reason it's referred to that way is because of the very low translational success rate that we have out of the lab. So for example, this is a small molecule diagram, but 10,000 compounds may be feeding through into only one thing that gets clinical approval by the FDA. And there's a long laundry list of reasons for that. One of them is that it's hard. Another is the investment that's required to bring things over the hurdle. And the, and the last uh, principal reason is safety. And that's what clinical trials are built around, establishing not just something works, but that we can do this safely. And so I like this cartoon. Nothing, uh, it's nothing that you have that a few stem cells in 75 years of research won't cure, right? It feels like it takes forever. But while translational research seems slow, in reality, I think it's important to step back and recognize that there are 49 CIRM funded clinical trials that are currently ongoing. So we talked about what is CIRM and this investment that Californians made in doing stem cell research. And this is one metric by which we look to see whether or not that investment paid off. And 49 clinical trials I think is pretty exciting. Towards that end, we have also um, a number of clinical research studies that have come out of the program here. These include um, actual first-in-man clinical trials for spinal cord injury, where two of the first trials were originated by investigators um, associated with the stem cell center. And for example, a clinical trial that's gone forward, it's moving into a, a phase two, three trial for retinitis pigmentosa. But what I wanna tell you about and foreshadow for Daniela just briefly is this idea of an alpha stem cell clinic. So, CIRM, in their actually pretty good foresight, launched the idea of developing a set of clinics that was built around specializing in delivering stem cell therapies and testing those for companies, for individual investigators, so that an IND, an investigational new drug application, could be filed, and there could be a rigorous assessment of whether or not there was both safety and efficacy on this translational spectrum. And towards that goal in 2014, the first three centers were founded, UCLA, UCI, we want a cooperative center, was one among those first three centers. And just last year, these were expanded to include UCSF and UC Davis. And the idea here is to provide an infrastructure, a support platform, in order to be able to do efficient testing of these stem cell potential therapeutics as they're coming through the trial. This is not meant for you to read, it's just to give you a sense of how active this program is. This is just the pipeline for our Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network, which Daniela directs um, and we'll talk a little bit more about here at UCI. So 
I want to come back to this um, slide just to reconvey the idea that this testing, to move things from bench to bedside as translational research, is something that this center and CIRM has been very committed to. I think it's very important, but it's hard to do. And it's um, important to have a continuum that we're feeding at the level of basic science research and at the level of the bench. And one of the ways that we do that, which was kicked off by Dr. Golub when he was director, is through a seed grant program. So just over the last three years, this is the list of seed grants that were awarded in a very competitive process through this center, about $350,000 distributed. But the number I want you to focus on is what the return and in investment in new funds has been. And that's over 17 fold. So by any stretch of the imagination, this has been a wildly successful program in terms of driving basic science research on up into leveraging additional funding from NIH, from, again, CIRM, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, or from foundations. And we're very, very proud of that success. Why is that so important? Well, it's important because we need to recognize that, in fact, funding for basic science and that, that continuum, the pipeline that drives research, has steadily declined. So for those of you who are old enough to remember the early 60s when the space program was in full gear, in fact, that was our peak of funding for anything to do with basic science and, uh, and research. And we've declined steadily throughout that time, going out through 2014 here. In fact, no matter how you measure it, whether it's as a percentage of GDP or a share of the total budget, the current federal budget for research in the United States is at about a quarter of what its peak was. And so having things like the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine and the SEED program is enormously important in terms of research success. So with that, I just want to introduce a couple of other things. One is some upcoming events. Our next public lecture is scheduled um, for September 25th. This will be Leslie Thompson and Neil Hermanowitz talking about Huntington's disease. So we hope that you'll all be able to join us. Um, another important date coming down the pike is November 14th. This is our annual um, stem cell symposium. And a key part of that is, in addition to lecturing during the day, we'll have Dr. Irv Weissman, who in many ways is viewed as the founder of stem cell biology, really fundamental um, to the field. And he'll be giving an evening public lecture as well that will be at the Beckman Center. So if all of you have signed up for this list, you'll be able, uh, you'll get a notice about that. And um, it would be great to mark it on your calendar. So what can you do for the center? Well, the first thing that you can do is to participate. Um, and one organization which I'm going to shout out in just a moment is Americans for Cures which is built around um, making sure that we're communicating what CIRM has achieved um, in California with the last 10 years or so of funding to the public. Um, and they have some great information about successes and clinical trials and status of where all of the different centers throughout California are. We have a newsletter, we have a website, and of course we have uh, an advancement program which is um, directed mainly through Janice Briggs and her contact information is there. So, just about Americans for Cures briefly. So this is how we came to Prop 71 to begin with here. And this is from their webpage about what CIRM's um, impact has been. And a couple of interesting things to look at, both investments in terms of education and infrastructure, the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic Network, which we already talked about, the funded clinical trials that um, they're bootstrapping in order to try and move forward and test new cellular therapeutics for all kinds of neurological diseases and injury for cancer, for diabetes, and so on, and the fiscal impact to the state, right, where there's been actually a return on the dollar for that investment um, in, in infrastructure and in basic science research on up through the translational continuum. And that's important to us because as Californians made a choice going back to the original Prop 71, we're going to face that choice again in 2020. And so tell your friends, tell your neighbors, get some more information and think about that because within the next two years, it's actually going to be a very pivotal time for basic research in California. And with that, I will stop and turn over to Daniela, um, Daniela Boda is um, our clinical director for the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic at UCI. She's also the director of the Neuro-Oncology Program um, and a very valued faculty member here in the Department of Neurology. Thank you for coming here tonight. I realize it's late. I realize that many of you are coming here after work. So please, please ask me questions, especially at the end of the lecture. We will try to keep you interested. We're gonna tell you a story, you know? That's what we do in the evenings. We gather around the fireplace. I know it's California, but bear with me and we tell stories. 
And the story that we have tonight is going to start a little bit with a hero story because we are all commemorating Senator John McCain, which was one of our country's heroes. And why is this important? Because we have to remember that sometimes the enemy is not a political system or a war overseas. And somebody that has survived so much and for so long actually ended up dying to an enemy that is very close to us and which is back home. So this is my fight. This is a fight that I'm sure was many of my team colleagues which are here tonight. And let's see where we are, what we have done, where are our thoughts going, and what can we do in the future. And one of the amazing things that we can do is to target the stem cells that are creating and recreating those tumors. So, hmm, the brain tumors, are different types and different origins. And we have primary and metastatic brain tumors. For the public, the primary brain tumors are the ones that are originating from the cells of the brain, the cells that are forming the brain during the development. There are about 20,000 Americans diagnosed with those tumors every year, and about 12 to 13,000 people dying of this tumor every year, which talks to about the fact that a part of those tumors are very aggressive. In the same time, we have secondary brain tumors, which are tumors coming from anywhere else in the body and lodging in the brain. And as our patients live longer and longer and do better and better with lung cancer, breast cancer, melanoma, we see more and more brain metastasis. So being able to pay attention to that type of research is another focus of our work. So, I promise this is the only picture where I'm gonna show brains, or almost the only one. And what I want you to have an idea is about how aggressive is this tumor, how it's spreading from one side to the other of the brain, how it can double every two weeks in a limited space where if you are adding volume by adding tumor, that means that you are basically destroying valuable brain tissue and you are creating pressure that can end up by torquing the brain stem and basically stopping the respiration on this patient. That is why the survival for many of our patients is on the 18 to 24 months interval. So the first question is, okay, have you guys worked on this? Oh, well, we have worked on this for a very, very long time. People try to actually release the pressure inside the head. Since the Egyptian, ancient Egyptian times, and you can see trepanation here, which was done possibly with the same cause, trying to help those patients. But in the late 70s, we have discovered the radiation. It's a good treatment for brain tumors. And then around 2005, we had the first chemotherapy drug approved for glioblastoma. Unfortunately, in spite of the fact that we have conducted more than 50 phase three advanced clinical trials since 2005 to 2018, we have only one additional drug and one device approved for the treatment of this disease. And the other question is, what does it mean approval, what does it mean success in our field? So one example of success, maybe the best example of success that we have right now, it's temozolomide or temadar, the oral chemotherapy that every patient with glioblastoma will get. The results on the clinical trial prolong survival from 12 months to 14.6 months. So if we want to define survival and a survival benefit, it's very hard to tell somebody that what you are promising against the chemotherapy drug is that you're gonna prolong their survival with two months. We are very excited in the oncological community when targeted drugs were developed. Bevacizumab is an example of a targeted drug. It binds specifically to a factor in the blood that is secreted by glioblastoma stem cells. And because it blocks that factor, it actually tries to stop the communication between the glioblastoma stem cells and the blood vessels and pre prevent the rapid tumor population. Those are mice brains, and you can see a large tumor here on the mice that were not treated with this antibody, and almost no visible tumor on the mice treated with the antibody. So this worked wonderful in mice. When I was a PhD student, we always used to say, mice are not little people. When we go to the clinic, I always have to remind myself of the opposite. But, <laughs> moving on. 
This is an example as of why. Because this worked wonderfully in mice. It worked on tumors that are all of them grown on plastic, grown there for years. But when we moved it to the people, what happened is that those tumors, yes, indeed, on the MRI, they look like they stopped growing, but they never increased the patient's survival. The approval by the FDA was done on quality of life, and quality of life is important. But unfortunately, on all the studies, the survival after the patient started on this drug, which was at the time of failing the previous regimen, was less than eight months. So, if you go to my clinic, to our clinic, and you do everything that you can do, and you do it well, unfortunately, you have this relentless progression from surgery to radiation to progression in seven to 10 months, tumor grows, to the only agent that is approved, to another six months of relative stability and going to hospice and dying. So, <coughs> This is a field of great promise. This is where we need to make a difference. If you think about creating yet another drug for lung cancer, yes, it's promising, but they already have 20 drugs. So we wanted to be able to make an impact on a field where an impact is possible and sorely needed. So what I'm showing you right now, it's a list of the clinical trials that we are conducting for this disease at UC Irvine. I'm not going to walk you through all of them, the same one which Eileen didn't walk you through the 49 studies I was trying to model based on what she was doing. So, you know, we will not do that, but I'm gonna show you some key studies. In our work, it's always a combination between the work that we do clinically in the Chao Comprehensive Cancer Center and the work that we do translationally in our alpha stem cell clinic. So, I'm going to show you one study from one side, one study from the other side, and then we're going to talk about the commonalities of those studies in order to see how can we all blend our interests and work together. So, this is something that to me it's very fascinating. About two years ago, one of our faculty in the Department of Mathematics, Professor John Lovengroup, came to me and told me that he is able to mathematically model tumors and help me understand what is the rate of growth on the tumor using mathematical equations. And based on that, he will be able to help us predict which combinations of treatments should we use for those tumors. Now for uh, the faculty and staff that have already met John, you know that he's very persuasive, so he has convinced me to feed into the model and give him MRIs and clinical data so we can validate. And we have published together a very nice paper in cancer research, so I'm very grateful for that. But most important, the lessons that we learn is that glioblastoma is like California. And why I'm saying that? There's so many different cells collaborating together from different type of genetic backgrounds with different functions and even with different outlooks on what they want to go and become when they grow up. So when we look at this very complex model, we are seeing stem cells, more differentiated cells, which are progenitor cells. We are seeing abnormal blood vessels, which we call transdifferentiated endothelial cells. We see the terminal glioma cells, and then we see dead cells because those tumors grow so fast that the cells in the middle don't get enough nutrients and they end up dying. So what we have to understand is that this whole model, this whole city also needs feeding terminals, and that is the angiogenesis model, which maintains the crosstalk between the glioblastoma and the vascular network. So this is an example, oh, this is wonderful. It didn't break this time. So this is an example of what the work that we did. This is a tumor, a mass of cells, that is treated with that classical treatment, with radiation and temodar. And what you see is that if you keep following this tumor for 200 days in this accelerated timeline, the tumor will continue to proliferate. Yes, you'll kill some cells, but majority of the cells will continue to be there, and then, unfortunately, the tumor is going to overtake. If you use, in addition to that, a differentiation agent, an agent that will remove the glioblastoma stem cells, you can get the tumor to shrink. 
And if you use a combined multimodality treatment that's going to target both the stem cells, the differentiated cells, and the vascular cells, we might be able in the end, if we can balance the toxicities and plan this just right, to achieve tumor remission, to eradicate the tumor cells. So starting with this idea that we need either to use multiple drugs, probably four different drugs, or to identify drugs that do more than one function, we have embarked in a search of looking at potential candidates. So, we were talking until now about glioblastoma stem cells. And it would be wonderful if our only job would be to eradicate the glioblastoma stem cells. But the glioblastoma stem cells are derived based on many, many publications from the normal neural stem cells of the brain. And there are different hypotheses. Some of them are suggesting that they are derived from the progenitor cells most commonly from the oligodendrocyte progenitor cells. Other data are suggesting that they are directly derived from the neural stem cells. But irrespective of the hypothesis, what you are getting is that those cells are very close cousins, and they live in the same environment, which is the brain. So my job now becomes more complicated. I have to eliminate those guys, but I have to protect those guys. And when you look at culture plates where we grow the cells side by side, you are not able to differentiate which of the stem cells are the cancer and which one of the normal neural stem cells. And even when you start putting them on differentiation markers, you can differentiate the glioma stem cells to a certain level and you can make them appear like they're trying to be early neurons or early oligodendrocytes. The place where they differentiate, we used to say, was the tumor formation. Because in the animal models, if you put cancer stem cells in the nude animals, they'll form tumors, while the normal stem cells should not form tumors. We are learning more and more, both in our basic science labs as well as in real life, that's not quite the case. And unfortunately, the one which we have learned that in patients was based on people that traveled overseas to get stem cell, neural stem cell transplants for a number of devastating neurological disorders. And when they came back to the care of a number of doctors here in the US as well as in the Western Europe, it was discovered that those patients were developing brain and spinal cord tumors. And when those tumors are operated on, they are tumors that are formed from cells different than the host cells. So those cells in the right conditions can form tumors. It's important to always be very careful because this is one of the things that we always want to avoid. Unfortunately, the glioblastoma stem cells are kind of the tougher cells out of those, and they are very resistant to the classical treatments, while the neural stem cells are sensitive to the treatments that we give to eradicate the tumor. Ending with a paradox, which we see many times in the clinic, where we cannot control the tumor or we control it for a very short time, but we are affecting the patient's ability to form new memories and to function in a normal cognitive state. Where we started this work was by trying to identify specific mechanisms that were more sensitive in the glioblastoma stem cells versus the neural stem cell. And the mechanism that we have identified as being specifically susceptible to proteasome inhibition, uh, specifically susceptible for stem cell, cancer stem cells, is the proteasome. The proteasome, I describe it as being the trash can of the cell. If you are a normal cell, you are very well organized, you have many trash cans in your house, they're all working appropriately and you have no trash. All the damaged proteins, all the abnormal proteins, all the things that you are bored of, like the old things, and you want to bring new things so you can respond to new signals in the environment, all of those are appropriately turned over. Now, if you are a cancer cell, you don't care about how pretty you are. Trust me, cancer cells are never pretty. You care about how many of yourself can you make more and more, and you care to escape cellular death. So you have much less of those trash cans, only the minimum number that you need, because you can, and you want to use all the other energy of the cell to divide and replicate. 
So what's happening when you completely remove those trash cans is that the normal cells, you are removing a certain percentage, they will continue to live. They are doing well. However, the tumor cells now are finding themselves overwhelmed with a lot of damaged proteins, and actually they go through cellular death. So we have started with an original drug, which is called bortezomib. And this drug was already approved for multiple myeloma. So our experiments were very nicely proving that we can use this drug to greatly decrease the protosome function in the cancer cells and still maintain a normal function in the normal neural stem cells. We have not continued the work on bortezomib. We have done a clinical trial, and that clinical trial was not very successful. And the question is why? You came with a good idea. You have a protosome inhibitor. You are giving it to the cancer patients with glioblastoma. It's a safe drug. The FDA already approved it. Why it didn't work for brain tumors, especially for glioblastoma? For a very simple reason. Not all the drugs cross the blood-brain barrier. Our brain is protected by a special structure, which allows us to have GI symptoms, but not to get meningitis when we eat something that's less than optimal. A lot of toxins cannot cross the blood brain barrier. A lot of drugs, especially cancer drugs, cannot cross the blood brain barrier. And this is one of the hypotheses of why we are seeing an increased rate on brain metastasis, on other cancers that get very well treated systemically. So in the quest of finding a drug that crosses the blood brain barrier, I had the opportunity at one of our meetings to hear about this new natural compound, which is called merizomib. It is made by a bacteria in Bahamas that sounded quite fancy. This is a tropical drug, organic, <laughs> farm-raised. You can see the whole pictures. And when we met, me and merizomib, merizomib was like one of the kids that is not passing the class, was a failed drug. And the reason for which it was a failed drug was because this drug was tried in a multiple myeloma study on which we already had another of his brothers, the bortezomib approved. Bortezomib wasn't crossing the blood brain barrier, so patients were doing well, while the multiple myeloma patients were getting was merizomib, confusion, cognitive changes, visual hallucination, dizziness, and unsteady gait. At which time, I basically fell in love with this drug because the message was, oh my god, this is a manageable drug which crosses the blood brain barrier. Of course, it's not as easy as that, because after you go to the company and you tell them, let's do a trial, they're like, for what? Because this drug was never tried in glioblastoma. And we took it to glioblastoma. We took it to glioblastoma with the help of a lot of people startup funds from the university, from ICTS, which is our Institute of Clinical and Translational Studies, with donor funds. We kind of made like a big effort because this is not the type of work that usually gets supported by the FDA or the type of work that gets supported by any kind of federal funding. You have to do the work in order to be able, in the lab, to be able to go to the clinic. But the first data that we got is we looked on the monkey brain, we give the monkeys those drugs, and we measure protosome activity. And we were able to see that this drug, on a few doses, was able already to reduce the activity in the normal tissues about 30%, confirming again that this drug is crossing into the brain. We then went and did a screening study in our glioblastoma stem cell primary culture lines and comparing them with the normal neural lines. And what you can see is that 100% of the neural lines were surviving very nicely at quite high doses of the drug, while the glioblastoma cells, the counterparts, about 50% or more of them, were dying at this amount of drug, which is nanomolars, meaning an amount that most hopefully we can cross into the brain. And then we got some of the mice. And those are our nude mice, and we have implanted them with intracranial patient-derived tumors. And we have tested on these mice to see if administering the drug will prolong survival as compared with just giving the mice a saline control. 
And lo and behold, we're also able to prove that the mice receiving the drug live longer. So can we stop there? No, we have to always try in multiple systems because the requirement when we go to a clinical trial is to make sure that we have done all the due diligence and tried it in different systems. And this is something from Dr. Hughes' lab, another of our colleagues, and he works on macrofluidic devices, which we always call tumor in a dish. And what you can see here is blood vessels in red and tumor cells in green. And the control cells keep growing and forming those little tumors. If we give marizomib, we actually are able to control both the vascular proliferation and the tumor growth. And at least on this system, we are achieving close to remission of the tumors. And that compared with the classical drug temozolomide, which was still affecting tumor growth and partially controlling it, but it was not healing the tumor, was just maintaining it in the stage of stasis. So the question was, OK, is this drug better than temozolomide? And at least from the data that we are having, this drug is better than the temozolomide because it's active against the cells that already have become resistant to the first line of chemotherapy. It doesn't do everything we want to. And this is an idea of when you do research, you have to look at the pluses and the minuses. You have to understand what mechanism will control the tumor, but what also mechanism might promote tumor growth, because you never have a perfect drug. And what we found out when we're testing one by one the things that we know that make tumor growth, we found out that this drug actually increases the production of one of the blood factors that will make tumors actually grow faster, that is the VEGF. So we realized at that time that we have to give the drug in combination with the antibody that we already have, the bevacizumab, and that only by using the two drugs together, we will be able to achieve tumor control. So wonderful. All those data got nicely packed by a new company that in the meantime bought the drug. So now we had another partner, which was a little bit more supportive. And we submitted an, uh, an application to the FDA and to the European agency, the AMA. And we got approved in May 2016 to start our first study in people. So the work has started in 2009. So it took us seven years to go from where we had the drug in 2009 with some ideas and no financial support to 2016 when we opened the first study in people. So the first study in people, when you always do it, especially for a brain tumor, you have to find out what is the safe dose that you can give the patients. You can calculate it based on what you know from animal system, from other patients, other diseases, but in general, you have to find what is the maximum dose. And then you have to find out when you continue to the next stage where you are trying to prove efficacy that the dose that you're going to give to all those patients is going to be a safe dose. So as you can see, this was quite a large study going through multiple, multiple doses, trying the combination with the other drug, which we call bevacizumab, trying it as monotherapy, only one drug at a time trying to see if different administration, different escalations. This was all the very complicated planning that we do every time when we want to embark on a larger project. Those are some of the data that we have presented at national meetings. And what we are finding out is that on some of our patient population, the tumor was stable at six months for 34% of our patients, while our historical controls were always between 8 and 10%. So this made us very happy with the data that we're having. And the thing that was making us actually less happy was the side of the side effects that we're seeing, which is always common. And quite interesting, as we have thought, what we found out were a lot of brain side effects. They are transient. They usually go away from 24 to 48 hours. But they are hallucinations, confusion, ataxia, dizziness, fall, dysarthria. So a lot of side effects that gave us a thought. And the thought was, what if seeing those side effects 
is actually a positive predictor of the fact that the drug actually gets in the brain for those selected patients that experience those side effects, because not everybody does. And we ask the question, is it possible that the people that get those side effects are actually the people that will gonna do better? And what you see here is actually that the six months overall survival for our patients was 83% for the people that were getting those side effects and only 59% for the people that were not getting the side effects. And the part that you cannot see here, and I'm sorry for that, is that about 20% of the patients lived 18 months or longer from the group that was getting the side effect and zero of the patients of the group that didn't get side effects. So then the question became, okay, should we consider maybe using the side effects as a marker of potential response? And maybe if the patients don't get side effects, they shouldn't continue on this study and be placed on other studies or other treatments that might give them a better function and a better benefit. And the other question is, why is that? So we went back to the lab, which is all what we do when we get confused about questions and we try to get answers. And yeah, there is a lot of also thinking in the clinic, but we are not going to go there. And what we have identified is the following. If you take normal samples from people that have donated their brain to science, we are not taking them from our patients, but if you compare the proteasome function in the frontal lobe, in the cortex, and you compare it with the function in the cerebellum, you see that the cerebellum proteasome activity, enzymatic activity, is much lower than the brain. However, for the tumors, and we have here about 40 glioblastomas, the activity of the tumor and the activity of the cerebellum are very close, which is trying to suggest to us that if we look and be able only to induce some balance problems, maybe some slurred speech, we will be just affecting the cerebellum and inducing an inhibition of activity on a level similar with the tumor. And that when we go for the confusion and all of the other symptoms, we are going too high in the inhibition. So this is quite a powerful idea, and we have kind of tested it in the clinic, because when we dose reduce the patients, we always do, we don't want to have people that are not doing very well and they cannot enjoy, the first symptoms that go away are always the confusion and the hallucinations, while the ataxia and imbalance actually hang out for much longer with even reduced doses. So, what can we do if we don't know what we are doing? We can get another MRI study. And we can see if in this MRI study on which we put patients receiving the drug, can we look at different areas of the brain and different functional activation of different areas of the brain and see if our hypothesis that we had in the clinic that we are seeing cerebellar activation as the main important factor is confirmed by our imaging. And lo and behold, this is the patients before they receive treatment. So this is the activity of the brain at baseline. And this is after one dose, and this is after three doses of the treatment. And this is where your eyes are, and this is where the back of your brain or your cerebellum is. And what you can see here is that we are seeing activation of the midline structure of the brain, including the cerebellum, the brain stem, the inner nuclei at the doses that we're using, this is very persistent and this is statistically significant, especially the red colors that you guys see. And we see increased activation ev after every drug dose, suggesting that we are putting those pathways in overrun. And this is a very similar pattern with what you'll see with somebody being drunk, which many times goes through the same mechanism that I described to you, the cerebellar mechanisms. So, then we went back to the lab and we say, okay, this is a cool hypothesis. Can we show that we have changes in the way in which brain cells communicate with each other that will explain the phenomenon that we are seeing in patients? So what you do is you have mice and you collect through the microdialysis the changes in the neuromediators in the brain and you can compare different groups. And what we ended up seeing is actually, I, I'm sorry, my slides, I think they are having a Mac problem and some of my slides miss half of them. 
Next time, I'm not letting them alone without me being there. <laughs> <laughs> so what we can see is that we are seeing a decrease in the serotonin expression, both in the brain and in the cerebellum. Serotonin is the neuromediator that coordinates emotional inputs. But it's also one of the mediators in the cerebellum that coordinates the one which we coordinate our movements. And when we s decrease serotonin, if you want to think that somebody very depressed, they also don't move a lot and they have problems of movements. And if they're really, really depressed, they can become even psychotic, which is the relation with the changes that we are seeing in the patient cognition. So there is a gradient. And we can see the gradient here. Those mice got very high doses because we wanted to make sure that we can measure the changes. So what are the future plans? Now we feel comfortable that we are understanding so much more about how this drug works in tumor, but also how it works in normal brain. And since we are understanding that, based on those results, we are now moving on a phase three study that started in the summer of 2018 and we're gonna enroll 700 patients in more than 70 centers, with the UC Irvine being the main center for um, the study center, the study chair center for 10 and other centers in the United States. So hopefully this is going to help us, but in the meantime, we need to continue the preclinical and biomarker work because we have another list of questions unanswered and every day that we go to the clinic and we treat another patient with this drug, might be another question that we need to take from the clinic, go back to the lab, understand it, and model it back. I'm changing right now, and I'm not going to talk too much about the stem cell, alpha stem cell network, because this is something that now you are familiar with. What I wanted to show you here is slightly different, that if you look at the clinical trials that we are doing, you can realize very easily the majority of them are in, neuro in neurology and in oncology. So that's basically, I'm a neuro-oncologist, so that it's so wonderful for me because I get to do most of the day things that I'm familiar with, but also I get to understand how different problems in different diseases correlate and can we move ideas from neurodegeneration and neuroregeneration or from other cancer in the world of brain tumor. So it's a level of cross-fertilization that having those 49 studies allow us in order to make more and more progress. So, vaccines. Everybody wants to know about cancer vaccines. And of course, we are very interested in immunity and we are very interested on how can we target that immunity against the glioblastoma stem cells. I will show you just two slides on a collaboration that we have with a local company, Ivita. The product is called AVGBM1, and we are right now running through the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic as well as through the network. We have numerous other centers in the new network joining us. The first in men study, and we are very proud of this because it's quite rare that you get to try for the first time one of those very promising drugs in your patient population. So what I'm trying to show you here, and I know that it's a little bit difficult to read, is that we have used immune therapies on cancers that are very immunogenic, like lung and melanoma. And this is where we are making the biggest, biggest advances. Unfortunately, if you look what glioblastoma is, is here, which means that occasionally might be immunogenic, not very common, not in general. The other brain tumors are around here. So what this is telling us is that we have to find ways to teach and train the immune system to recognize those tumors. It's not enough to elevate the immune system. You also have to train it about what is the non-self, what is the tumor that it needs to attack. And the way that we do it many times is by taking immune cells from the blood, taking them to the lab, and subjecting them to stem cell antigens, so now they know who is the enemy, they know who is the tumor, and they can be re-injected in the patient to go in the patient's body, activate other cells, and then hopefully start attacking the tumor. So, tumor gets resected, the tumor population gets prepared, the stem cells are processed, the short-term cultures are created, the same one which we create them for the lab experiment, in the meantime, the patient has this separation of the dendritic cells, which get mature. They get to meet in the dish, and then they get injected in the patient. 
It's a very safe treatment. Everything that we have until now, multiple dendritic stem cell studies, none of them has shown toxicity in other cancers. The dendritic studies in GBM with other type of antigens also were also very safe and tolerated. So hopefully we'll be able to give you more data next year. We just have enrolled the first two patients. It's very much in the beginning. But this gets us to the idea of the story. We need more discovery. We need more discovery coming from the laboratory. We need to be able to take it to the clinic and then give it back to our researchers to help us continuously improving what we have. Because two months is never enough. We have to do better. We have to keep doing better. We have to also to champion the therapies. And championing them means also championing for support and championing for funding and working with all our collaborators in other international and national centers and industry. Thank you so much. And Eileen, do you want to talk about your contribution? I think it's a little bit important to do this piece. So I'm, I'm going to tell a story, as Daniela said, we can all gather around the campfire again. Um, that's the idea of how cells, how cell therapies, how basic science can move into the clinical translation spectrum. And this has a lot to do with the idea of serendipity and why we need to have a pipeline for basic science research. And so for that reason, it's something I think um, that would be, be good for us to talk about. And so this is titled Science Serendipity and Self-Renewal. It's the serendipity piece that I really want to try and bring out a little bit. So you all have seen this picture before. I showed it when I introduced the idea of stem cells. Imagine that that, for the sake of argument tonight, is a stem cell. And the point I want to make to you is that stem cells live in a niche. This is actually a slide I stole from Lisa Flanagan many years ago, who's here. They have a niche that's defined, like most everything else in our life, by space and by time. And when we talk about a stem cell niche, what we mean by that is the location that they're sitting in and the stuff that's around them, the molecules that are there, the signaling factors that are present. So a niche can be a macro environment, right? Here's the University of California Irvine campus. Here's the ocean not far away. That's a macro environment. We can think about it that way. And a macro environment can be different, right? And this is in Montana, where there are mountains and trees and water and things that we don't bump into very much in Southern California. If we go down to a finer scale, a niche can also be in a, a micro environment. We can sort of zoom in on that, right? To the forest and to the individual components even of a tree. And that's comparable in terms of thinking of going from a niche as your body or as an organ down to the level of a cell and where a cell lives and, and what it's communicating with. And that niche that those cells live in is actually really, really important for many things, for maintaining those cells, for that process of self-renewal where they're dividing and making daughter cells that can go on and do other things, and for telling these cells what to differentiate and to do, how to go up the branches and become lineage restricted, and what to be at the end of the day, what specific fates they should select, and the ability of these cells to migrate around, to move up from the trunk through the branches, if you will, is really, really important in that instructive process. So why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this to set the stage again for this idea of a continuum, of a translational pipeline, because my lab does not work on glioblastoma. My lab has spent most of its time since 2002 working on therapeutic cell transplantations for spinal cord injury. That's our bread and butter. And we've done all different sorts of studies that are based around the basic science, understanding therapeutic window and things about the microenvironment, about mechanisms of action of these cells, to really, really granular preclinical studies about what kinds of cells to, to use and, and where to put them and when to transplant them. And those things have led to two first-in-man clinical trials that have gone forward. That's been very, very exciting for us. But along the way, we've learned some lessons about stem cells and how they behave, and that's what led us down this serendipitous path. And one of those is that while timing might not be everything, it actually is really, really important in the context of a niche. And while we see cells that look like this, everything that's labeled in brown here is an individual human cell. If we transplant more delayed, when we transplant at a different time, we get a very different picture. And so again, every cell that's in, everything that's here in brown is a human cell, but you can see at this early time point of transplantation, they've migrated in towards the middle of where a spinal cord injury is. They haven't gone up and down the spinal cord. And in fact, 
those cells become something else. They become almost all astrocytes. And while when we transplant at these late times, we get recovery of function in these animals, that's what led to clinical trials, here those cells fail. They're listening to the niche. They're listening to the microenvironment in a different way. They're getting different instructions, and so they can't behave the same way. So being basic scientists, we ask two questions. Why? And can we do anything about that, right? So can we think about changing how those cells behave by modifying the microenvironment, the niche that they fit in? So while money makes the world go round, in reality, it's gradients that make the stem cell niche go round. And I find, especially late in the evening, that using a nice glass of Guinness is a great way to get people's attention focused on this idea. And so that's why I'm illustrating it this way. The basic concept of a gradient is that distance and time matter, right? So I said stem cells live in a niche that's involved, um, that's controlled by space and time. So here you can see a niche that's quite distributed by and large, but it's becoming progressively segregated, right? Until finally, in the end, you end up with a barrier as molecules maybe separate. And those things all provide instructive cues, both during development and in the adult stem cell niche. And it turns out, as I'm going to come to in a moment, in the context of cancer stem cells. So when we had this result in the lab, we knew actually an awful lot about spinal cord injury and that it was different in different places. And because of that information, um, we focused in early on on two molecules that we were interested in, one called C1Q, the other called C3. And if you just look here at this at the bottom, this is showing you C3 at the epicenter in an injured animal versus a control one. There's not much going on here. And that with distance, moving rostral or caudal, the amount of that protein that's present goes down, right? So that's a part of our niche cues. It's spatially confined and it changes over time, right? That molecule that we're particularly interested in is C3A, and it's a part of the immune system, the innate immune response called the complement cascade. So there'll be a test on this later, so you should all look at this diagram very, very closely. Um, but the idea I want to illustrate is a really complicated cascade. There's over 40 soluble proteins that are in your circulation all the time that are contributing to it. We were interested in just this one or two in particular. And what we did was we tried to block it and say, well, what happens then to these neural stem cells if we just blocked that? And we did that experiment in our planning. Actually, I'll come back to that in a minute. We did that experiment blocking this antibody. You can see here's a control. Here's an animal that received antibody. And again, everything that you see labeled in brown is a human cell. And while here, these cells are confined towards the middle, as I showed you before, when we block C3A, and in fact, it's its partner, C1Q, now those cells are free to migrate up and down the cord. We dramatically change what the environment is like. And in fact, we can change what those cells become. So instead of getting faded towards being astrocytes, they'll behave uh, differently and become both neurons and oligodendrocytes. And in fact, if we are able to block these proteins sufficiently, now we get recovery of function when we transplant these cells at this time point. So we can in restore their capacity to yield repair. But this is where the serendipity part comes in. So I don't know if you can read this uh, cartoon. It says, I was planting a flower when I struck oil, right? The idea of serendipity is that you find something interesting by accidents as you're going along and asking a question. And in this sense, the most exciting phrase, because I want to try and make people curious in the audience tonight, is not the most exciting phrase we might hear in science isn't like Eureka, that you have a discovery, but, but what? That's funny. What happened there in that experiment? And I'm showing you who this quote is from. It's Isaac Asimov, not just because I liked iRobot when I was a kid, but because interestingly enough, many of you may not know, he was a PhD professor of biochemistry in Boston. And so he spoke really from an interesting understanding of how biology worked and the sorts of problems that we bump into in the lab. And this, that was our first that's funny moment because the experiment that I just told you about here as I was up in the lab, it's months of planning that go into these transplant experiments, and Mitra Hushmand, who was my graduate student at the time, in fact, it's the very first experiment that we did after moving into this building, came flying up to my office and said, oh my god, we have a huge problem. This can't work. We can't do this the way we planned. Nothing is working. I said, this is a slow down. So, uh, when you do these experiments, they're big and complicated and long, and animals have been primed and ready to go, and all the reagents are there, and everything is timed. The cells are ready to go. It's very difficult to say, like, uh, okay, we'll just abandon all that, or no, we're going to do it another day. It's really not an option. 
So we powwowed in the lab very quickly, and it turned out that our original plan was to do these injections by taking our neutralizing antibodies against C3A, mixing it with the cells, and injecting that. And so we had two different antibodies we were testing, anti-C1Q, anti-C3A, those two mixed together. Any of the cells that saw the neutralizing antibody against C3A clumped up and became like a lump of concrete and couldn't behave. And we said, why? Like, I have no idea what's going on here. So we rapidly redesigned this experiment, which resulted in this successful result. And so we said, OK, we can't possibly put them together. We'll put the antibody in the middle. We'll put the cells outside, and we'll see what happens. Yay, we solved the problem. The experiment worked. But we had this funky result, right? We had this moment of, but that's funny. We had no explanation for why this blocking step did the thing that, he did, that it did. So we filed that away. And we did what most basic scientists would do. And we went ahead with a new graduate student in the lab, Francisca Benevente, and said, OK, well, let's understand the basic biology of how this molecule, C3A, is interacting with neural stem cells to begin with. And so after a lot of experiments, one of the things that uh, Francisca was able to show was that, in fact, these molecules, C3A is a molecule, signals through the C3A receptor. That's not entirely surprising. All of these red dots that you see here on neural stem cells are places where those two molecules, C3A and its receptor, are interacting right at the cell surface or getting internalized, which tells us that signaling is going on. Yippee, that's cool. We know what the receptor is. This is very exciting. And then Francisca did the rest of her control experiments. And she came and said, that's funny. I don't know what's going on here, because all of my other controls, other molecules that I look at this way, the cells, when I don't treat them with ligand, I don't treat them with C1Q or other positive controls, there's nothing there. There should be no red dots. But in these cells, if I do nothing and I just look for C3A and C3A receptor together, there's, there's binding that's going on. How can that be? Well, that can be if there's something called an autocrine function going on. So microenvironment is all about paracrine inter interactions, right? Paracrine meaning signaling from outside the cell. But autocrine signaling is the opposite. Autocrine is like the cell when it's talking to itself. Now, I do this all the time in my office. Some of you may share that trait. But it basically means that the cell is making signals that are um, helping it to survive, perhaps, helping to control self-renewal. But it's talking to itself. And that's kind of surprising. In fact, Francisca went on to show, which I'm not going to walk you through this very complicated slide, but it's to give you the sense that it's really complicated and it took a lot of work on her part. Francisca went on to show that not only do these cells talk to themselves, but they really are making their own molecule. They're making their own C3. They're making their own C3A receptor, and they're cleaving the C3 into its active form so that they can talk to themselves. That's a lot of work for a cell, right? It takes a lot of energy for a cell to invest in doing that. It means it's probably a molecule that's doing something important, which led us to our next that's funny moment. Does anybody know what this is? It's a horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs are 450 million years old. And the reason that I put a picture of a horseshoe crab up here is that this molecule, C3 and C3A, was first identified in horseshoe crabs. It's the very foundation of what our innate immune systems are built on. It has nothing to do with the central nervous system. It has nothing to do with neural stem cells. And so we said, why on earth would neural stem cells be talking to themselves using this molecule, right? That's an interesting bit of biology. And so we went back to the idea of autocrine signaling and what our best guess was in terms of why a cell would talk to itself with this molecule. And that was the idea of the niche, right? That a cell might be getting signals from the immune microenvironment, but have somehow adapted that to be taking on an autocrine role. And so we asked, what happens if we block this autocrine function? And we did it in a pretty nifty way. So Katja Pilti, who was a postdoc in the lab at the time, divined a method um, making neural stem cells from a reporter mouse. So this is a mouse that was engineered so that cells that are red are ones that are stuck. They're not dividing. They've finished the cell division process. Cells that are green, when a cell enters the cell cycle, it lights up green. And so we can see that cell division is taking place. And hopefully, hmm. No, wrong way. Mm, nope. Can you guys see that? Yeah. All right, fine. 
So I'm worrying unnecessarily. So everything that's red is a cell that's stuck. It's not actively dividing, although it might be moving around. And if you're watching on this side, just as it's replaying on the side that the control, you can see that there are green cells that are popping up. And in fact, at the end of that experiment, you end up with far fewer cells where the autocrine signaling with C3A has been blocked, right? And that is, it turns out, because those cells, these neural stem cells, are incapable of self-renewal and maintenance when you're blocking that signaling mechanism. And so we can look at that graphically here. So these are cells that are treated with control. All these branch points are cells that divided. Everything that doesn't have a bubble on the end of it is a cell that survived. But here, where we've treated with this blocking mechanism, now the cells almost always fail to divide. And in fact, most of them are dying at the end. And so it suggests that this molecule that shouldn't be in the central nervous system at all, is all about the innate immune response, is actually controlling a neural stem cell talking to itself in order to complete self-renewal and survival, that it's involved in cell maintenance. That's funny. So where could that play a role? And that's when we started thinking about cancer stem cells, and particularly glioblastoma stem cells, because as Daniela told you, it's one of the few examples of solid tumors where we actually have a pretty good idea what cells they come from. They come from neural stem cells. And so, in fact, there's a very interesting set of hypotheses about what happens in a solid tumor and how a cancer stem cell derives. One is the idea that there's an expanded niche, right? So this microenvironment that a cell lives in. It adapts by acquiring mutations to be able to live not just in that niche, but maybe in an adjacent one. A second idea is that it develops the capacity through mutations to live in an alternative niche, right? So it can take off and expand outside of its normal microenvironment. A third possibility is that there's some niche independence. In other words, it acquires a mutation where now it doesn't have to listen to any paracrine signaling. It can just control its fate by virtue of talking to itself, by autocrine signaling. And related to that, um, a self-renewal mutation as a possibility, so that now a cell that should normally be dividing at a very, very low pace only as a part of self-renewal acquires a set of mutations where, again, it can provide those signals to itself, and so it propagates out of control. Well, that would make an awful lot of sense in terms of the molecule that I just told you about. And this is a slide of Daniela's, right, where what she demonstrated in terms of modeling with John Lowengrub was that if you don't, in the course of designing your treatments for things like cancers and glioblastoma in particular, to include factoring in targeting a cancer stem cell, you're always going to have a consumer that reacquires the capacity to expand, right? So we're very interested in new molecules that might be a way to target that glioblastoma or cancer stem cell population. And so Francisca and I pretty much dashed over to Daniela's office and said, help, help, we have an idea. And Daniela said, oh, I have reagents. We can do something with that. And so we did a long set of experiments over the next year or so where she passed on to us uh, a lot of her knowledge and advice and gave us both primary tumor samples to work with and some glioblastoma primary and stem cell lines in order to be able to test what was going on. The idea is, if we have a cell that's acquired mutations and has expanded its capacity to live outside the niche by talking to itself, then those molecules should be really highly expressed, right? We'd expect to see a lot of C3A, a lot of, a lot of C3, a lot of C3A receptor. And in fact, that's just what we see illustrated here. So these are control, and these are progressive stages of glioblastoma, worse and worse, and the amount of expression of these proteins goes up dramatically. And at the same token, we'd expect that if we blocked this molecule the same way as we did before, we would drastically impair the capacity of those glioblastoma stem cells to be able to survive and self-renew. And in fact, that's what you see here. We drastically increase cell death. The capacity of these cells to self-renew and expand as a tumor, at least in a dish, goes down dramatically. And in fact, that's accentuated even if we select and look for the cancer stem cell population in particular. So what happens if we look in actual glioblastoma patients? So this is data that's from a National Cancer Institute um, funded set of databases that we can look at hundreds and hundreds of patients and what their uh, tumor biopsies look like for levels of expression of different proteins in microarray or in proteomics. And if we look at the level of expression in actual human tumors, we can see that the higher the expression of these two molecules together, C3 and C3A receptor, the worse the survival kinetics look like. In fact, if we add in CD133, which is an important marker for 
how frequent the presence of glioblastoma stem cells is, that gets even more dramatic. And in fact, then if we segregate this population and look at the particular subtype of glioblastoma where we know that glioblastoma stem cells um, are enriched, in fact, this is the division that we see. So the higher the expression of C3, C3A receptor and CD133, the drastically worse those patients do in response, suggesting that this really basic biological mechanism that we find in neural stem cells has a clinical relevance. And so based on that, in fact, with um, Daniela in very close collaboration, we've moved to her tumor model so that we can test whether we can identify this way something new in our translational pipeline that might make a difference and move through clinical testing down the road. And that is my group. All of these things um, happen in a huge village, as everyone here can imagine. Um, but in particular, I would shout out Brian Cummings, who's here tonight, who's a very close collaborator. Of course, Daniela, as I've highlighted a number of times. Mitra Hushman, who made the original, what is going on with that, comments. Um, and Katja Pilti and Francisca Benevente, who did an, uh, essentially all of the GBM work. So with that, thanks, everyone, for coming this evening. Um, Daniela maybe can join me up here and we can field as many questions as people have and hopefully we're not too desperately bad in terms of time. So thanks for coming. Absolutely, this is something that we have tried many times and when you have seen that slide where we talk about four drugs, what we're propo proposing on that is to repurpose some older drugs. The problem with repurposing older drugs is many of them unfortunately have significant toxicity. So there is a value to that but we have to balance it with the risk of toxicity. Dr. Gallo. Thank you. This is terrific. Thank you very much for this. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why you can't get around the blood brain barrier. Aren't there drugs that open it? Can you put the, the drug that doesn't pass directly in the brain or in the spinal cord? Why, why is this barrier insurmountable? Good question. I've been asking it for a while. So let me try to answer it step by step. Uh, why can't drugs cross the blood brain barrier? It's a matter of size and it's a matter of being lipid soluble. So in general drugs that are bigger than 120 kilodaltons are not going to cross. Actually in our collaboration when we are looking at the antibodies that Eileen are, is proposing to move into the clinical arena, we have to be very careful what we can have on that antibody and what we can't not, and we're gonna have most probably an antibody fragment that's going to be developed. About delivering in um, the brain, uh, we are having a number of collaborations on nanopart nanoparticle area and endosomes areas, and there are a lot of promising ideas, but none of them has yet panned because it's not only about getting in the brain, but then getting in the environment of the tumor where you have different diffusion forces, more edema, more tight junctions. That it's, that's a lot of difference on that biology. Uh, the virus injection and the virus delivery is trying to address that, but the virus is injected directly in the tumor cavity during the surgery, and it's hoping that the infectious process will proliferate in the brain. CSF, it's a completely different space. Actually, drugs that get into the brain don't even get into the CSF, and many times we have to inject them directly in the CSF. And they will penetrate only for 0.5 centimeters. And I can even give you more answers, but I think this might be enough for tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what would it cost to take an antibody and do a clinical trial? Oh. Well, <laughs> um, it depends what you're doing, right? So just to develop, so 
to develop, let's say, an antibody as a, as a therapy. Um, you can't develop just one because you don't know which one is going to work well, right? So you've got a potential size problem, as Danielle mentioned. And we can't take a mouse or a rat or a sheep or any of the antibodies we conventionally use in the lab and do that. We have to have a humanized antibody. Otherwise, with the body of a new that we injected into it, it's going to clear its super path, right? It's going to recognize it is not self. And it's never going to get a chance to do what we asked it to do. So we have to develop not just an antibody, a humanized antibody or a human antibody. And then you don't know how specific it's going to be or what it's going to recognize. So one isn't enough. You've got to develop a panel with that. And that right there, you're looking at about a million dollars of development costs. If you do it such, in such a way that you, you get the IP, the intellectual property, along with it, so you have some control over, over where it's going to go. So now you've got a thing that you go all the way back full circle and you start testing in animal models, just like we are now. So you go all the way back to ground zero and you repeat everything that you've done in a dish and everything that you've done in an animal to pick the one that seems to work the best, maybe one or two targets, and develop a safety package that you can move through um, the FDA to even think about doing a clinical trial. So that right there is another, as you well know, something in the ballpark of two to four million dollars. And then you can start thinking about what clinical trial costs would be. So relatively cheap in the, the big spectrum of things. Then to carry it over into actually enrolling subjects with all of the follow-up that goes on after that, these in the ballpark of somewhere between 10 and 50 million dollars. So I think that uh it's a very good explanation. I just wanted to add that if you were able to go through the phase one and the phase two, and now you are at the $50 million, which is where the development will be, going to a phase three study, just conducting that study, it's going to be somewhere around $150 million. Because usually you need to enroll anywhere from 500 to 700 patients. So this is staggering cost of discovery and this is why we need support from all levels and I don't want to do another pitch necessary for CERN but a lot of the things that happened in the clinical trial world in stem cells were able because there are millions of dollars coming from CERN grants and helping us at least navigate the preclinical and early clinical data. So one of the barriers that is um, actually quite important in terms of that translational pipeline is most basic scientists, myself included, given a choice, will get hung up at the stage of thinking about how things work, right? Because that's what we're trying to do. Thinking about how to take how things work and move it on through the next stages is something that it helps an awful lot to incentivize people because it's not rewarded in your publications and it's not rewarded well in terms of other sorts of funding mechanisms. And so um, CERM, I think, did an amazing job of opening up that pipeline and then incentivizing people to move the moment, right? And just from you know, Brian's experience and mine with spinal cord injury, for example, right? We did our very first transplants for spinal cord injury to in collaboration with the company to test human neural stem cells for therapies in 2002. And it's the first trial for that kicked off in 2010, like eight years. That was pretty fast on the scale of drug development, similar to what Daniela described in her case. But that's like light speed for what happens in normal clinical development. So um, CERN definitely has been sent for that, that entire process. Impact-wise, right, the other really important aspect of the value of death, I think, is um, well, I think academic trials are the way to go because um, companies move to the courses 
that surround them and their investors in the way that results in dropping certain indications and picking up others and you know sometimes leaving very promising therapeutics behind unless they are also incentivized, right? So I like academic clinical trials because um, we can think about controlling those quite tightly. But the reality is in order to really move things forward, you have to convince companies to stay on track and, and play ball. And so companies are a lot happier with that if they have phase one or two data that suggests that there's going to be a promising outcome. So if they're poised that having to make a decision for moving from the bench, the basic science investment piece, on into that first phase one, two trial, and they have to pop $20 million or $40 million out of pocket and raise venture, venture capital to do it, that's a heavy lift for anybody, but especially for a startup. If CERN can pony up half of that, which is the way most of this trial network is work, well, that lowers the barrier significantly, right? And I think that's why in California, in large part, so many things have been able to move into clinical trial, at least to that stage of testing, right? And then at the end of that phase one or two process, if in fact there's promising data, the third will raise in the hundred or hundred and fifty million dollars to be able to go to a phase two and then the physical study becomes more achievable. I would I would address it in a slightly different way, which is um, because of the constraints of the time that CERM has right now and we all have was the last clinical trials get it funded. CERM has gone for what makes an easier target. And I, I know that cancer is not necessarily seen as an easier target, but in a way it is an easier target. It's much easier to measure two, four, six month survival than trying to measure a chronic disease and are you improving people's quality of life. So right now it's cancer and it's repairing um, single mutation or single gene diseases where we are very successful and curing a lot of babies with all kind of blood disorders. But it is my understanding, and what actually CERM has asked me to participate on, that the next funding is going to bring us even more hope and more help in something that we're extremely st strong at doing at UC Irvine, which is neurodegeneration, neuroreair, understanding of complex neurological disorders. So what is going to help with the funding? Hopefully we're going to go back and complete the Huntington disease studies, complete our Alzheimer's disease studies, go back and try to cure Parkinson. So I think we're going to have a massive impact on the future. And I, that's a great answer. I would just um, sort of trickle down on that. I think that um, if CERN, in fact, is re um, what we don't have right now with CERN is the whole problem, right? And because the effort has been made to move as many things to as possible. It's a logical decision. But what we don't have is, is the pipeline funding. And so rebooting that pipeline and going through the things that are hard, right, that really take a long time to get to read out back to spinal cord injury, and as Daniel said, to Alzheimer's, to other neurodegenerative diseases, things that it's difficult to enroll enough subjects for. It's hard to keep biotech who is fled out of the neuroscience arena involved in. I think the potential impact there is for this particular center, which has a, a, a real strength in the neural translation in particular. Yeah. You are making dinner, yes? We already ate, it's okay. You mentioned seed grants having a 17 fold amount of investment. I think a lot of people don't know what is a secret, how big is one, and when you talk about 50 million, 100 million dollar trials, I put my check over there. I can't afford it. But, so what is this, how big is a secret? I can't either. Um, so as the seed grants that we have issued for the center are between 25 and $35,000 for a one year period, right? So in our philanthropy program, again, started um, by Dr. Golub, who's here tonight, they, we were built around the idea of just trying to get people enough money to get preliminary data to be able to really strengthen their proposals that are larger to large foundations to the NIH and to CERN for that matter. So that the twenty-five dollars to $35,000 investment is going towards over a one-year period is being used to gather data that allows for a three-year or four-year or five-year grants for Two hundred or three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars a year, right? And that's why the investment is so significant. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
One more. Yes and no. So when we when we have created a mathematical modeling, how did we choose what to add and which drugs did we choose and why? And the in which order did we add them? So that was based on our real life clinical experience because you have based on the standard of care pattern, which is ethically to respect because this is what we know it works, even in limited fashions. So it will start with the combination of radiation plus the antimatotic chemotherapy, which is the temozolomide. So then when we added, by example, the marizomib at the first line, we added it plus radiation plus temodar, because that will have both an anti-endothelial, transendothelial cell effect, which is what I was showing, and an anti-glioblastoma stem cell effect. So with that, with that three drug combination, we're hoping to cover all those four. So we have to start with the two that are a given, and then we can add more, trying to mimic how a successful clinical trial will look like. Yes? So we can talk about how drugs are used against almost all cancers. So what makes this drug stand out against normal cancers? Is it the blood brown barrier? Yes. <laughs> it reaches an amazing concentration of 1 to 100, the blood concentration, but that's better than majority of the other drugs. All right. We'll stay in case anyone wants to sneak in some questions here. But thanks, everyone, for coming.